but with the practical effects and Secret Santa, a lot of the reviews are saying it's a good mixture between you know your practical effects and then CGI effects. Yes. Um, I'm sure yeah. budget plays a role into this, mm -hmm. but what are all the factors when deciding, okay, we're going to use practical effects for this shot, CGI for this shot? Um, in the case of Secret Santa, it's a 100% budgetary, and I'll tell you exactly how. So I did not plan on having any CGI in the movie, none, okay? There was this extraordinary room that we used uh, for a lot of the action in the film, this great room at this beautiful house, uh, cabin, cabin, you can't call it, uh, mansion <laughs> on Big Bear Lake. It's done cabin style, but it's a mansion. Um, so we have this giant room, and um, in that space, there's, they had plush, beautiful carpeting. Well, I'm not gonna tear up the carpet, that's insane, but I knew this place was going to run red with blood. I knew blood would be everywhere. So I'm like, okay, we're going to buy lining for the entire floor. We're going to do a plastic lining and then put carpet over that lining. Okay. So there's no way the blood can get into their beautiful carpet ruining the carpet. So uh, in doing that, there was a giant seam in the middle of the room. One long seam that you could see in, a, in, in probably about 30 or 40 shots. Mm -hmm. We had no way of getting rid of the seam. It was impossible. So we went, okay, I'm not gonna destroy the carpet. I need to put this down. Uh, at that point, my, my, uh, my composer, a guy named Tim Eilers, who Tim and I, um, God, again, we've been friends for a couple decades. Um, Tim, his, uh, his main job is he makes giant props for some of the biggest movies in Hollywood. So he made like the dinosaur bones in Jurassic Park. He, um, he made the icebergs in Fate of the Furious. He did the giant gun in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. He's oh, that nice. guy. Yeah, no, he's, he's the shit. Yeah. So, but, but the thing is, what I've known about Tim since I met him, he had read a script of mine. This was literally 22 years ago. He read a script of mine that he flipped out over. And he said, uh, dude, would you mind if I like, just wrote some music to this script? And I was like, you, you write music? He's like, oh yeah, man, that's my passion. Like music is everything to me. I was like, um, yeah, I, okay. If you want to write music to a movie that hasn't been made? Sure. He wrote music to about 20 pages of the script. And if you read the script with the music, he timed it out that while you were reading it, the music would hit at certain points. It's to this day, the 20 best minutes of film music I've ever heard. So when I formed Skeleton Crew with, with, with my partners, I, I, turned, I, I called Tim. I said, Tim, dude, listen, you still want to do music? He was like, oh, my God, more than anything. Making icebergs is killing me. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I said, listen, uh, again, I have no money. But if you, want to do, if you want to do our first film, if you want to do Secret Santa, I will, I will make you the company composer. Like, you will do this job. And this guy jumped in so much. Dude, I have got... On Secret Santa, I've got two full albums we're going to be releasing, two full albums of music um, from the movie. One full album that's all just soundtrack. The other album is all reimagined Christmas songs that are incredible. So the other thing that I didn't know about Tim, so I was like, God, what am I going to do about this line in the floor? And Tim was like, oh, I can get rid of it. I'm like, what, are you going to make a patch? He's like, no, I can, I can, I can just do it digitally when, when we're done. I was like, you can? He's like, yeah, no problem. So that was the first digital thing. And again, you're never going to notice it's even in the movie because you won't see a seam in the carpet. It's gone, okay? But here's what happened. Bob Kurtzman was doing all the physical effects. And here's the thing. You want blood to spray in a certain direction. You want blood to hit a certain thing. You want blood to come out of somebody's neck and keep pulsing. And while we did all of that on set, the thing that you don't have time for is retake and retake and retake. So much, we did so much blood work on the movie that uh, Bob had to call buddies in LA to ship more blood to set. <laughs> it was the one thing we ran out of. He's like, I need more gallons of blood. So here's the thing. The only digital effects, the only stuff that was changed in the movie was blood spatter. A couple of really cool surprise things that I would never give away until somebody sees the movie. Um, and an eyeball effect. Again, I won't say when and where. Uh, but an eyeball popping from someone's head was added to digitally. So here's the thing. 
it would come to a point in a shot where I'd go, okay, I can't do another take. We got to move on. I got to keep the day going. And Kurtzman was, and Kurtzman who also does digital effects, like, look, you can do it this way, this way, and this way. Then Tim took over and would do the digital effects. So here's the thing. All of our digital was only used to enhance what Kurtzman had already done. So whenever you see some digital blood in the movie, and there's a, look, by the way, digital blood is digital blood. I know. I'm not a dumbass. I know. <laughs> um, and so there are moments when you're gonna, when you're gonna go like, oh, that's digital blood. Like, I, we're gonna do that. So the, the, m most of the audience never gonna know. But for those of us that are love horror, we know when digital blood's been used. Sometimes I'm using it simply for a comic effect or I'm just adding to the spray. By the way, there's a ton of times when you won't notice that I use digital and it's digital. So, um, and uh, again, there's, there's like three or four times where you're like, oh, digital blood. And trust me, I'm the first one to go, Ugh. you know, I, I hate digital blood. But for most of the audience, they're going to need that for the gag to play. So I'm not above using it. I, I, I think, I, again, I think horror fans get a little nuts with this stuff. And it's like, listen, I'm not a giant fan of digital. I get it. But it's one of those things that when you need it, you need it. And it's a tool. And it's, look, you know, again, if I had, you know, if I had a $10 million budget, I would have done this. I would have done the movie very differently from that standpoint. And you would never know that any of that happened. And by the way, I would also do 40 takes of everything. But when you're running and gunning it, you know, you get two takes. Move on. Let's go. So you can't reset all the time. Yeah. Um, but I will say there are I don't, about six effects in the movie that have nothing digital involved whatsoever. And they are truly spectacular. Just incredible effects. So Bob, Bob killed it for me. He, he, he just <laughs> he hit it out of the park. Back to uh, Secret Santa and Skeleton Crew. Um, with it being a skeleton suit crew produ production, what were some of the positives and negatives of essentially being your own boss on this film? <laughs> uh, look, here's uh, the po the most positive thing about being your own boss is one you you uh, the, the the buck stops with you, so you end up um, for better or for worse. And I've said this from day one. If people hate the movie, that's cool. I'll own it. Okay. I, what I, what I hated the experience that, 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 that uh, myself and both my partners, both Deborah and, and Brian hated was when we would make something and then someone else would either recut it or rewrite it or do something to it that we had nothing to do with. And then we would get a bad review based on something that someone else did. And I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't write. Let's put it this way. Okay. My wife and I never wrote the line do your thing cuz at the end of Texas Chainsaw 3D. We didn't write it. We didn't write it. Uh, I will also say this. We did not write the scene with the cell phone in, in Texas Chainsaw 3D. You know why? Because the movie took place in 1993. So no one had a smartphone. Yeah. It's, the, it's ridiculous. We didn't write that. And I will tell you, I have taken so much guff from fans and from critics alike where I'm like, wait a second, the authors of that movie had nothing to do with that nonsense. That's, that's just a lie. It's just not real. We, it's, it's idiotic. And so when stuff like that happens as a filmmaker, you start going, well, okay, so, so my name is on the thing, but it's not representing who I am as an artist. It's not representing what I was paid to do. Um, and, you know, the timeline on Texas Chainsaw 3D is that shit crazy it just doesn't make any sense um we were you know we we tied the movie to the first film which i love doing and it was respectful and honoring toby that's what we were trying to do mm. and then you put a smartphone in when there's a when it's 20 years later that's just not okay so um when we when we started skeleton crew it was a chance for us to uh to make movies that we believed in and that we knew the logic of those movies again rested on us if somebody doesn't like something in secret santa they can blame me and i'll take the credit for it like if they hated something about it, i'm like cool i get it and i and i did it um the the 
tough part about, about it, and by the way, here's the thing. Um, I'm never my own boss in, in a way, which is great because I have partners. Um, what, what's so good is when you have, especially three partners, and, and, and we are all very different people, the three of us, um, but we, we've all known each other for so long. You understand each other. You know how to give each other enough slack to be to so that people can be who they want to be inside of the filmmaking but you've always got people that you trust who have their eye on you and know when to say no um look there are some great filmmakers out there that over the years their movies start to suffer because they become so powerful as filmmaking voices that no one says no to them anymore and i think that's an enormous mistake i, I think Filmmaking is a collaborative effort. I do not believe in the auteur theory. I think it's bullshit. And by the way, I was, you know, I went to NYU film school where the whole place is about the auteur theory. <laughs> it is a big fat lie. It's a lie. And I love NYU. NYU all day long. It was an incredible place. And, you know, I won best picture there. It's what launched my career. I mean, I, I adore it. But the auteur sure. theory is, is nonsense. And usually they base it on, on Wells, who, by the way, had so many collaborators in his filmmaking, to call him an auteur is such a sin to every person who worked for him, to the writers, to the lighting artists, to the cinematographers. Th th there were so many brilliant artists surrounding Wells, and I love Wells, but when people say auteur, I'm like, uh, cut it out. Um, filmmaking is collaborative. If you don't have people around you that can challenge you, um, and challenge your notions, you end up making movies that are really kind of up your own ass. And so I, I love that I have partners who say, really, you want to do it that way? And then I have to defend my position. If I can convince them of my position, great. If I have a reason for it, great. And you know, uh, in particular, Brian is such a good producer in that he gives me just enough room to, um, to do what I need to do as a director. And if he sees that I'm getting the job done and the dailies look great, Brian stays so far out of my way. He'll just sneak, he's very funny. He just kind of drifts onto set like a specter and nobody even knows he's there. And suddenly I'll turn around I'm like, oh shit, Brian, hey, hey dude, good, hey, all right. Um, so that's to me, that's part of his greatness is he really allows me to be the artist I need to be. I'm Cunningham, hear about your work. <laughs> and and uh, I guess my follow-up question to that was be really how does a twenty-three-year-old, no offense, gain the trust Not of the studio for to pick up the reins of like one of the more major franchises in horror? Yeah. Um, okay. So here's here's the here's the scoop with Sean. Noel Cunningham, Sean Cunningham's son, uh, was my best friend since the time I think we were eight. Um, and so I was a fixture in the Cunningham household. Uh, my whole growing up. Uh, and I was bouncing around when they were making the first Friday the 13th. I was there for spring break. Um, I was there for house. I was there at the, at the table read of house. Um, I was just always there. Uh, I was a theater kid <clears throat> when I was growing up. And um, I started, I, I was apprentice editing for Sony Pictures by the time I was 13. This is in Westport, Connecticut. I was, uh, my dad lived in Manhattan. My mom lived in Connecticut. So Sean had lived in Connecticut his whole life uh, in Westport. And um, so by the time I was 15, I started my first theater company. And Sean was actually, Sean, Susan, uh, Sean's wife, uh, ex-wife, Susan Cunningham, who is, uh, who, who's like the mother, uh, the mother to all of us. She's the most amazing, extraordinary woman. Um, and she was an editor. She was the editor of uh, uh, things like uh, Friday the 13th Part 2. Um, she's a brilliant, brilliant filmmaker herself. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the, the, I was kind of part of the family. I was just sort of like the son that he didn't need or want. <laughs> um, but he was incredibly supportive of my theater work uh, back then. Um, I had started my first theater company when I was 15. And uh, I was running two theater companies um, up through college. And it's actually part of the way that I paid my way through school. I paid for all my films by doing theater. Um, when, I, when I won Best Picture at NYU for So You Like This Girl, which is a purely a romantic teen comedy. Um, it's sort of John Hughes meets David Mamet. Um, I... I got, a, I, I got a ton of accolades at the school. We, we actually swept the awards. We did incredible at the awards. Uh, and again, remember, the, this, there are hundreds of movies 
uh, being represented in those awards. So it was, it was a big deal. And uh, the problem is, is that I made a movie that was a comedy. I made a movie that was in color. Uh, I made a really pop fun, you know, John Hughes-like movie. Mm -hmm. That's not very NYU. So NYU, even though it won Best Picture, didn't even bring the film to LA when they brought the showcase of movies that won awards. Oh, it was crazy, dude. Really? The movie was, the movie was so good, in fact, that we were the first movie to ever win the Ensemble Cast Award at NYU, um, given to me by Marquetta Kimbrell, who's a genius theater uh, 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 acting teacher at NYU. Um, and so we did so well, but they didn't deem it NYU enough. So when I graduated, I got, I got two job offers and I was already working for a company in New York called R. Greenberg and Associates, which uh, I was working on the, the titles for Goodfellas at that time. I was working on with, a Brian, with Brian De Palma on a film. Um, I mean, I was already really immersed and I, I, hadn't, even, I hadn't even graduated yet. And um, so I got two job offers. One was to work on season two of Twin Peaks back in the day. And the other was from Sean Cunningham, who had seen the film and was like, look, you got chops. Um, come to Los Angeles, be my, basically be my bitch for a year <laughs> and I'll give you your shot to direct. So I ran to LA and dude, I had 300 bucks in my pocket and no driver's license. Cause I lived in New York. I didn't need a driver's license. I was a bike messenger in New York. So uh, that's how Sean found me. When I got to LA, I had a project called Johnny Zombie that a brilliant writer named Dean Laurie had written. Um, and we, we had been workshopping it through college and Dean was my closest friend in, at NYU. And so uh, I brought this script out with me because that was gonna be my directorial debut. And uh, eventually Dean was flown out by Sean. Uh, we workshopped the script, we got the script in great shape where Sean was really thrilled with it. And then we did staged readings of the script for executives. And the movie got into a bidding situation. Disney ended up, pony up ponying up the most money, which broke my heart a little bit because this is Disney of the early 90s. So, um, you know, sort of the unhappiest place on earth. And, uh, and they, I knew what they were gonna do to the movie. And they took this subversive R-rated horror comedy, wait for it, musical, uh, <laughs> and they just neutered it and turned it into a movie called My Boyfriend's Back. Well, I was now an associate producer of that movie. I walked away from the directing. They were, you know, it was just never gonna be the movie I wanted to make. And Sean, in return, said, look, New Line's buying the rights from Paramount for Friday. If you can figure out a way to get that goddamn hockey mask out of the movie, <laughs> I'll let you direct it. Now, by the way, Sean had, Sean's even been quoted at festivals, at a festival, there's a, there's a YouTube clip of Sean saying, I'm a fucking liar about that statement, <laughs> okay? Now, the amazing thing about that clip is that he says, I'm a fucking liar. Kane Hodder is sitting right next to him and Kane blanches at that and Kane does not blanch. So Kane looks at him like, what? And Sean starts to backtrack immediately because he knows what he's just done is slander me in public, okay? Because here's the thing, and you bring up the perfect point. Sean Cunningham, okay, is in his 50s, and he's the guy who created the largest horror franchise of all time, okay? I am 22 at the time that I got this job offer, mm -hmm. 22 years old, film school grad with no credits of any kind except a win at NYU, okay? So either I overpowered Sean S. Cunningham and told him, look, we're gonna get rid of that damn hockey mask, you fool. <laughs> or, or Sean told me to get rid of the goddamn hockey mask. Now, here's the thing, Sean is either a neutered eunuch <laughs> and I overpowered him or, and I'm the most powerful 22 year old that ever existed yeah. or, or it's Sean who's the fucking liar.
So, he can, by the way, he can take his choice, whichever one he likes. I come out looking great either way. Either I am so powerful that I can do that, or he's lying. <clears throat> so, here's the thing. Sean, Sean did not like that mask. He didn't like Friday the 13th. He was caged by it. And by the way, to his credit, <clears throat> Sean had stories he wanted to tell that were amazing. He had scripts that were written. He didn't write them, but that he, he, he shepherded certain projects. While I was there with him for years, I was, I was at Cunningham Productions for three years, there were projects that were beautiful, well-written, that were um, sensitive and emotional. And I asked him at one point, I said, Sean, what is your goal as a filmmaker? I said, you've done so much. You, 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 you've conquered so much. What do you want to do? And his response to me was, I want to win an Academy Award. And I was like, wow, the guy who made Spring Break and Friday the 13th wants to win an Academy Award. <laughs> okay, fuck yeah. And I, and I got to tell you, he's the kind of guy that I was like, awesome. Then you should win an Academy Award. But that hockey mask, which by the way, isn't Sean's. That hockey mask doesn't come in until part three when, mm -hmm. his, when his first sort of um, uh, um, mentee uh, Steve Miner, you know, is is taking up. He's already taken over the franchise from part two to part three, and that's when the mask shows up. Sean loves to take credit for it. Now he's the guy. <laughs> no, he's not. Um, he made a movie about a mother murdering campers because they they she thinks they neglected her child, and she's nuts, and she's killing everybody. That's what he made. The Jason Voorhees movies happened after Sean's movie. And suddenly, this hockey mask, I think, sealed his career in a casket with a hockey mask on. And he wanted so desperately to tell other stories that that, I think, he had an anger about that thing that trapped him. But it's the gift that kept giving. So it's a curse that is this moneymaker. So I get it. I get where he's coming from. I totally understand that. But let's be honest. I mean, you know, the 22-year-old 20, the did not tell Sean Cunningham what to do with his franchise. So we'll tell you this, you know, Sean, um, you know, Sean believed in me. And, uh, and for that period of time, I believed in Sean. And, and Sean was like a dad to me. Um, the problem is, is that when, when business gets involved, um, Sean is not, he doesn't, he's not the father anymore. He's a business guy. And that's a shame because I really love Sean, um, but we really don't have a relationship because, again, you know, he wants to kind of rewrite history a little bit, and that's fine, uh, whatever. I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be harmed by it by any chance. Um, you know, I, I uh, Sean, you know, brought me to New Line. Um, Mike DeLuca was, you know, kind of a, a fan immediately and seen my stuff. Um, Mark Odesky was my other uh, um, executive over there, and they were both incredible. But I had to literally take a um, – I, I had an oral quiz from Bob Shea in his office about horror movies. I'm not kidding. And uh, at the end of it, after I, you know, answered my questions 100% correctly, uh, Bob uh, turned to Sean and said, well, he doesn't suck. Let's let him, <laughs> let's let him test. So I, I directed a director's test and they gave me the job. They were like, we totally see it. We get what this guy can do. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how I got the job. Uh, I will tell you again, because I've been work, I've been working in the business since I was 11, um, either as an actor or in crew capacity. Um, and I think, you know, most people thought I was this kid who came out of film school and got a job. Well, yeah, that's true but I'd already been working for a decade before I went to film school. So it's like, you know, when you're, you know, when you look at Ryan Gosling's career, you know, you, you can go, God, he came out of nowhere. No, he came out of the Mickey Mouse Club, <laughs> sitting next to Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears. Yeah. That's where they all came from because they were kids and they worked their asses off as kids. I worked my ass off as a kid. I, by the time I left New York and Connecticut, I had done over, over 70 shows. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, a there's a curve on how someone develops and it starts from the moment they start working. Um, look, I will tell you this, it was daunting the first day on set making Jason goes to hell and being 23 and going like, I have fooled everyone into thinking I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> By day three, I knew what I was doing.
I did. Um, I, 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 had, I, I had enough youthful, foolish confidence um, that I was able to lead a hundred person crew and, uh, you know, and make a movie that look to this day, I'm still very proud of that movie. I, I know it's the most divisive movie in the franchise. I got it. Um, I'm the Halloween three of the Friday 13th. Well, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Um, that's fine. And that's fine. And by the way, here's the thing. What I love about, about my, about my chapter of the Friday 13th saga, which by the way, I'd love to put this to rest. Um, okay. I made a movie that's in the Friday 13th franchise. It is canon. Deal with it. Yeah. Like the people who go, it's not canon. It's absolutely canon. Your fan film is not canon. My movie is canon. Sorry. Sorry. And by the way, listen, there are some Friday fan films that I think are so badass and awesome. And I love them. I love them. I love them. I love them. I do. Um, and, and, and here's the thing. I don't think we're going to get any more Friday films. I think that these, I think fan films are the future of the Friday 13th franchise. So things like never hike alone, God bless it. I love the, I love the Vincent. They did it. I think, and by the way, he's an awesome dude. Um, I love Voorhees. What's going on with that. I even gave them money, those guys. And I never give people money mm -hmm. on, on, on any kind of, you know, Kickstarter, but I love what they're doing. So I, I totally dig it. And if you can take elements from this franchise and make a career for yourself, more power to you, go do it, man. Like just go do it. That being said, I made a movie in the franchise. It's part nine. It's canon. Yes, did I did I throw in some deadites in there? Damn, Skippy, I did. <laughs> I also got Freddy to grab that goddamn mask and started a whole new part of the franchise. So, and and by the way, that was my idea. That wasn't a studio idea. That wasn't Sean. That was me and two of my roommates who were getting stoned to the bejesus. I don't <laughs> indulge, but I love people who do. Um, and I was trying to come up with gags for the movie of like what in jokes I could put in the film. And so I immediately was like, wait a minute, New Line owns Freddie outright. We got to get the glove. Freddie had just been, just been sent to, to, to hell. He had just mm -hmm. died, right? So Freddie's dead had happened. And I was like, he's dead. Who better to pull Jason into hell? Let's get Freddie. So, um, so, and New Line amazingly let me do that. Um, of course, they were, they were all like, <laughs> yeah. money, you know, and good for them. They should be. Um, but it's, uh, no, dude, you know, the, the movie is canon. Um, and I, I am proud of it. And I'm proud of it also because there are people who dislike it so much. I mean, dude, literally in the last month, I have had people online wish me cancer because of the movie. And I'm like, and by the way, listen, again, in the sense that I am all for anybody saying whatever the hell they want to say, I'm like, cool, good. I'm not going to get cancer because you, you said that. You're going to get cancer because you are that angry about a movie. Yes. If you're that angry about a movie, you, you're going to have some serious health issues. That being said, what's great about people who hate it and people who love it I made a movie 25 years ago to this day that people still talk about all the time. That's awesome. That's, that's crazy. When Jason Goes to Hell came out, the day it came out, there was another movie that came out, debuted the same day. Uh, have you ever seen Searching for Bobby Fischer? I heard of it, but I haven't seen it, no, unfortunately not. Okay. Here's the thing. Um, it is, uh, it's a masterpiece. It's an extraordinary film, right? Uh, ben Kingsley, Joe Montagna, Joe, Joan Allen. It's a beautiful story. It's incredibly well told. It's from the same, it's from uh, a director and writer. The guy wrote Schindler's List. This is an amazing film, okay? I paid to see Jason Goes to Hell. I had seen the movie so many freaking times. I was like, I cannot watch this movie again, but I wanted to pay for a ticket on the opening night. I walked into Searching for Bobby Fisher, okay? And it's a movie that to this day stays with me. No one knows this movie happened. No one talks about it. It's never on a top 10 list. It's, it's literally like it didn't happen. And it came out the same night as Jason Goes to Hell. And it's got Academy Award winners in it and Tony Award winners in it. I made Jason Goes to Hell and everyone still talks about it. Dude, come on. That's, that's awesome.
things where, you know, there are people who like now talk about Elias Voorhees as, you know, well, Elias is his father. And I'm like, no, he's not. No, he's not. I created Elias Voorhees. In fact, I personally, solely created Elias Voorhees in the first um, treatment for Jason Goes to Hell. Mm -hmm. Back when it was called Heart of Darkness. Okay. And the reason it was called Heart of Darkness, you want to talk about pretentious. Boy, was I pretentious. Holy <laughs> shit. Um, uh, uh, Orson Welles, the first movie he wanted to make before Citizen Kane was an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. He was 23 years old. I was going to be 23 when I was directing this. I wanted to call it uh, Friday 13th, Friday 13th, Heart of Darkness. Uh, and it was simply because of that. So that is incredibly pretentious and awful of me and very film student -y. Um, but, but in that original treatment, I created Elias Voorhees. The reason I called him Elias is because I wanted the characters to all have biblical names um, because Pamela, in, in the way that I structured her, was a religious fanatic. And so she had these two boys and Elias was born with all kinds of welts and this horrible skin disease. So he looked awful. Jason was born smooth. So she loved Jason because he was her beautiful baby. And she rejected and hated Elias. And it's why no one had ever heard of Elias. Because Elias was the child that she, she would have nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the original story was Elias is the one who actually steals Jason's heart. He brings Jason up from, the, from, from uh, Crystal Lake. And he uh, has built an, uh, this janky, horrible, hideous operating theater in one of the cabins. And he steals Jason's heart and Jason wakes up. And there's this struggle between these two brothers, one holding the other one's heart and Jason's squeezing Elias's head and pustules are popping and everything else. And the veins and cartilage are pulling away from the heart um, in this sort of death struggle. It was the opening scene of the movie. And then Elias eats Jason's heart in order to gain his strength. And he does this using the Necronomicon, uh, a, a passage in the Necronomicon that will allow him to take his darkness. That's why it was called Heart of Darkness. Um, and then, of course, Jason is now in Elias and wants out. And the story of body hopping came from that, is that Jason keeps ripping open the, per the, the body he's in. He keeps destroying the body from within. So the person has to put, the, put Jason into the next person. Um, and that was kind of the concept of it. Um, but... Uh, the comic books have been, look, by the way, I own every Friday the 13th comic. I love them. Um, I'm a big comic book nerd, always have been. Uh, so I love that they take liberties and that they found stuff in Jason Goes to Hell in particular that they could branch out with. I mean, it's no surprise that Ash showed up in those stories. I put all the stuff in my move. The whole thing is in my move. <laughs> um, I mean, I shoved in as much Evil Dead as I possibly could. And when you look at the creatures at the end of the movie that are dragging Jason to hell, it's all deadites. I mean, mm -hmm. it's right on Army of Darkness, which I was on set for when we were pre-producing Jason oh, Goes nice. to Hell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when nice, I asked Sam. Nice. That's, when I got the, that's when I got the Necronomicon from Sam. Um, so, I wanted to... I Look, way before there was a Marvel Universe... I wanted to make so many of, of my horror icons and the people I adore to go, that, that, that I went to see and spent all my money on in the 80s, I wanted to bring as many of those characters together inside my movie. And I didn't have the rights to a lot of those characters, so I would sneak them in. Um, and New Line was awesome. They let me do it. Like they were, they were really excited about the fact that I was doing this kind of self-referential movie. And remember, I did this you know, three years before Scream. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was offered Scream back when it was called Scary Movie, right after I did Jason Goes to Hell. My agent gave me the script. It was like, they, they want to talk to you about doing Scream uh, or, or Scary Movie at that point. And uh, the minute Wes Craven said he was interested, I was like, I'm out. Uh, <laughs> not going to happen. I get it. I get it. Um, I'd known Wes my whole life as well because he was Uncle Wes. Mm -hmm. So I always knew Wes because he was Sean's partner for many years. Um, so again, you know, I made this self-referential horror movie. It wasn't, wasn't quite as meta as, as, as the Scream series is. Um, but it, look, I mean, the first eight minutes of Jason Goes to Hell is truly 
turning the conventions of every single Friday the 13th movie up until that point on its ear. That girl, you know, Julie, you know, Julie Michaels, who I adore, who I think is just the best. Uh, Julie Michaels playing Agent Marcus. By the way, I did not name her Agent Marcus. That's like way too narcissistic. Sean Cunningham did that to, to fuck me over because, <laughs> because I put the movie in Cunningham County, which drove him nuts. So he was like, he was like, uh, he said to Jimmy Gleason, the actor who plays the head of the FBI group, he said, listen, when you go up to the camera, say, uh, Hey, go get cleaned up, Andrew Marcus. <laughs> and they did it on set, and I was like, motherfuckers. I was like, I couldn't believe, couldn't believe they did it. Uh, but, um, but, you know, she goes to that cabin and truly does everything you're not supposed to do in a Friday the 13th movie, which, of course, is why the FBI is stinging. That's how they're getting it. Um, she's bait and she's doing all the stupid shit you don't do it. it why is she in a cabin taking a shower in the middle of the night alone what, I mean come on this is stupid yeah. um, but, that's, but that's the fun and so uh, I was never making fun of the genre by any means I was really just counting on the conventions of the genre to help me tell the story I wanted to tell um, so look it, you know uh, yes did I intend for all that stuff to be in there sure uh, was I you know, was I excited that people got excited? Look, dude, when people see the crate in the basement, I got to tell you, it was awesome to hear an audience of that period get that I was doing that. Like, people would cheer. And I was like, awesome. I didn't think anyone would find the reference. Like, I didn't mm -hmm. think anyone was going to figure it out. People totally got the reference. And that was like, because for me, that we didn't have Easter eggs yet. Nobody was doing that. And I did it because I was a fan and I wanted, I want, again, I, you know, I always said about that movie, you know, it's, it, it was made for the fans by the fans um, because I love those movies. I love those movies. Great about part five is that it's dirty. Mm -hmm. There's like a dirtiness to it, which makes it feel more naughty and like you shouldn't be watching it. And that's awesome. Like that's that's what I love about that movie is there's like a there's just a dirtiness to it that I think is so like I just think it's awesome. It's Have you ever been approached or had any interest in writing for another major horror franchise? Yeah, yeah. Um, we were approached. Uh, we did a pitch for um, a Hellraiser movie um, uh, with Dimension back when Dimension was you know there. Uh, <laughs> and pitched to Bob Weinstein. Um, and uh, he loved our pitch, actually. Uh, but then Clive came in, and he wanted to do something with the Hellraiser franchise, so they were going to go in that direction. And then they never ended up making another Hellraiser movie. Um, and by the way, it's a shame, because I really, I wanted to sink my teeth into Hellraiser. Like, I, I, lo I, love, I love the first couple of films in that franchise, and I think there's such life in that franchise mm -hmm. that I... I I think you could really do some cool stuff. I just think that they always kept it too small and that it could expand out and, and be a, a, a far more explosive um, series. But um, Deb and I have been approached on three different occasions to do uh, Leprechaun movies. Um, I have turned them down all three times. Um, I, I just... Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I was asked to write, I was asked to rewrite and direct Pumpkinhead 2. Um, I didn't do that. I was going to do it. Uh, but at the time, the way American filmmaking was going, uh, you know, they wanted to make a movie that was in the bayou. They wanted to make mm. this like really kind of, you know, much like the original film. And I love the original film. Um, and they had this voodoo woman and all this stuff they wouldn't let me cast actors of color. True story. And I said, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. You want the movie to be in the bayou and you want it to be about voodoo, but the voodoo witch is white. What? Yeah, that, that makes absolutely no sense. But this is back when a studio would look you dead in the face and say, look, you know, black doesn't sell overseas. And I'd be like, what, what, what? A good movie sells any, what are we mm -hmm. talking about? Now, by the way, they're not wrong. I understand their algorithms. I get what they're doing. I get their business model. Um, but I simply could not in good faith do that movie. What I did do, I recommended a buddy of mine to direct it. He ended up directing it. And then I recommended that they use my cinematographer who happened to be African-American. So I feel really thrilled that I was able to get 
an African-American filmmaker a job on the movie. Uh, at least for me, that in some way balanced the scales. And he's a genius cinematographer. So I was thrilled that, that he shot the movie. Um, but I'm telling you, dude, it was, uh, yeah, I, 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 because they would not let me hire black actors, I said, I, I don't want the job. Um, it was, uh, it just didn't make any sense to me at all. Um, I forget, forget about the PC notion of it, which is there, absolutely. But the fact that you, you're telling a story that at its first step out of the gate is completely false. That's not for me. I'm not going no. to tell that story. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've been approached about a lot. I was approached about an Amityville film. Um, you know, uh, oh, and I was, and my wife and I were asked to do uh, a draft on the remake of The Omen, which we turned down. And that was a good paying job. And I was like, I have no way. No way. Why are you remaking The Omen? Why? Why would you do that? There's no reason. I mean, no. you know, and I, I remember the uh, one of the producers said, well, do you think it's sacrilegious? I said, what do you mean, theologically or cinematically? I'm like, you're talking about an incredible masterpiece that now you're going to, you're only going to make it less incredible. Yes. You can't make it better. Sorry. So it's like, hey, let's remake Jaws. No, let's not remake Jaws. on uh steven williams who is who's a god i just adore him um he and i ever since he played creighton duke we've wanted to work together again and and i love the creighton duke character it's my favorite thing about about my film and so steven and i are going to be doing a movie together uh that i am writing right now with with my wife that that skull and crew is going to make it's it's a bigger budget movie but um it is uh inspired by Creighton Duke. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen That's Williams awesome. will be Stephen Williams will be playing the part, but it's inspired by Creighton Duke um, because I can't get the rights to the Friday, you know, anything in the Friday 13 franchise is locked up as it could possibly be. Unfortunately. Which is fine. Yeah. yeah, which is fine. I get it. I get it. Um, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna go, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna talk about the side I'm on, but I'm pretty sure you can figure it out. Um, and for me, it's uh, you know, I think that um, I think there's a story to tell that's inspired by that character because I love that character so much. Um, and we're, we, are, we are prepping a movie right now that is, uh, it's called Hell's Bells. And it is, um, it's the thing I am absolutely the most excited about in the world that I'm directing. Um, and uh, it's unlike, it's, it's, it is a crazy freaking movie. Um, and, uh, it will definitely go back to the heart of some of my favorite things in the genre. Um, it has action like you won't believe it's crazy, dude. It's, it's a crazy movie. So, uh, I'm working on that right now. Um, just in, in sort of how genre, how I'm taking genre and trying to make original stuff that still has the feeling of some stuff that's in our favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm also doing, uh, I'm producing a movie uh, with, with my partners called uh, Fat Camp Massacre. Um, that, yeah, yeah, good, good. That's the Love style it. I want. Love it. Um, and it is, um, it's teens, it's overweight teens at a camp uh, and, and horrible things happen. Um, and it is, for me, what we're trying to do is massacre. What we're trying to do is make um, what will end up being, um, the get out of plus size people. That's the movie we're making. I like um, that. that. That could yeah. be really cool. I like that. It's really cool movie. Yeah, we're 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 very excited about it. It's very political and very funny, and also the it has the single goriest, grossest thing we've ever written um in there and it's uh, it's awesome there's a brilliant screenwriter uh, uh actress actually uh named Lin lindsey hollister who who wrote the original the original script and then dev and i have uh, joined forces with her and we're all kind of putting this thing together um and a couple of fantastic producers who are also actors um and uh, uh sarah cheney and heather alt and they're the ones who brought us the project and we fell in love like the minute I fell. I told him I fell in love at Fat Camp Massacre. Like, yeah. it had to be. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that one kind of goes back a little bit to the Friday 13th roots. You know, it's camp horror, um, not camp horror, but ca- horror at set of the camp. Um, and it's, um, it's brutal, dude. It's brutal. Uh, and I think it's going to be, you know, the, the, the last thing that people can outright make fun of that people can still be brutal about is weight issues. And that drives me nuts where I'm like, wait a second, we can't talk about anything else, but everybody can still be sizest. What is that? The line of uh, Fat Cat Massacre is never trust a skinny bitch. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. I can't wait to see this. That sounds awesome. Yep. yep. So, <laughs> so, so that one, uh, we're shooting that this year as well. I was one to again, thank you for uh, coming on our show. Absolutely. And the dude. very first guest on Death Curse Society. I love it. I'm greatly humbled. Thank you. Happy to do it, man. Happy to do it. And thank you for getting the word out about Secret Santa. By the way, um, just so your viewers know, we're going to, um, we go live on Amazon on Tuesday. So people can order from Amazon. They can order from us. Either one is fine. But I know a lot of people just like to be able to click on Amazon. They've got it on their phone already. Boom, get it. Uh, but we're Blu-ray and DVD this year. Next year, we'll be, um, you'll be able to do VOD. Uh, and then we'll be on some streaming sites eventually. But I, oh, I'm, nice. I'm going to roll. I'm going to roll it out slowly. I, I want it to be a movie that people have to find, and they have to they have to go grab it and get a copy and uh, check it out.